our last uh, week here, so probably don't need to repeat too much, although I will repeat. Uh, right. Uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, yeah, I'll have to repeat something. Uh, you can't assume perfect, assume perfect memory. Uh, okay, so, so I want to talk about uh, this uh, strange world of non-commutative computation and especially talk about divisions. And uh, I, I'll uh, talk first about the standard polynomial lower bound, just uh, uh, polynomial I mean without division. Uh, talk about this world where we have no divisions. And then I want to talk about both completing and balancing of formula, completeness of formulas and balancing of formulas in both of these domains and sort of tell you what are the differences. And uh, yeah, these are basic things starting again uh, uh, in the 60s uh, for balancing, 70s for completeness with variance. Uh, and uh, they get more complicated as you move to non-commutative worlds and to worlds with division, but the uh, principles are similar. So nothing is really, is really going to be difficult. Uh, I'll remind you what this is, this uh, the skew field of fractions. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, mention basic theorems that we will need actually for proving the lower bound I told you on about inverting a matrix in the in this world. And uh, then I want to talk about uh, polynomial identity testing, which is here, and rational identity testing, which is here. Uh, and for this, I'll, I'll tell you about the Amitsur Levitsky theorem, which is a really cool theorem, very basic theorem in non commutative algebra. Uh, and hopefully, I'll have time to talk about division elimination. So it's a, yeah, it's a long plan. So uh, let me first uh, uh, start with the non-commutative lower bound. So we again we are in in this world where x i x j is now not assumed to be x j x i. So non-commutative variables, and I uh, told you two things uh, last time. I showed you that uh, we define the polynomials, for example. Uh, Determinant, so the Cayley determinant, Cayley determinant uh, of matrix X for variables X, I, J is the sum sigma permutation sine of sigma, call that X, I, sigma of I. And I mean it in this order. So when we talk about uh, we talk, to, we talk about polynomials, we have to specify their order, and of course in computation we have to specify the order of multiplication. So uh, I mentioned norms result that the formula complexity, so L of the Cayley determinant for n by n matrices is at least 2 to the n. And I want to say it just briefly, I, I'm sure some people have seen this just to highlight the basic technique because later I will uh, talk about this theorem uh, with my paper with uh, Pavel. Um, that uh, <coughs> formula size now with divisions of the inverse is 2 to the n. And uh, you'll, I want to stress that it's a very different world, and the proof is very different. It relies on completely based, uh, you know, different properties, and uh, that's uh, one source of hope that uh, in this non-commutative world, world with division, we have more tools, more invariants, more something that we can prove maybe also circuit lower bound. So these are formula lower bound. And uh, but before I get there, I um, I told you that one of the I think great open problems. Uh, in, in arithmetic complexity is just proving circuit low bounds. So I want to show you uh, some path or direction towards proving uh, low bounds uh, for circuits. So low bounds in uh, world. 
And uh, yeah, this is from a paper uh, with uh, with Rubes uh, Yodayov. And this hopefully will take, as the whole story will take about, yeah, till 11, if we are lucky. So, ask any question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, no, no, it's all, it's all here. It's all here. We are now here. There is no division. So I just mentioned that I will later, that's why this is in parentheses. I, c I want to contrast it to show how different it is. So let me really tell you in very briefly what's the idea of uh, uh, Noam's lower bound. I mentioned also that he proved this lower bound not so just for the Cayley determinant, Cayley permanent, but also for a, a very simple function, palindrome function, that uh, is computed by linear size circuits. So it separates exponentially linear uh, you know, circuits and formula. And uh, what's the idea? So the idea is that. Uh, Formulas, formulas are a, a weaker model than branching programs, arithmetic branching programs. Sometimes called ABPs. And how does an ABP look like? I'll already define it in a sort of as a homogeneous, uh, as a homogeneous thing. You have a start and source node, and now you have layers. And you have the usual address. So just like in, uh, in Boolean branches programs, those of you who have seen them. And what you have on every edge, so an edge E, so here would sit a, a linear function L of E, L sub E, which is a linear linear function in the excise. So some linear combination of the excise. So you, if you, you fill this uh, graph with such linear function, you can define what is the function that is computed here. The function is simply the uh, sum over all paths, the product in each path, so edges path C, let's say, edges E on C of L sub E. Okay? Computes a polynomial in a very obvious way. And it's really easy to see that formulas are, you know, can be simulated by branching programs. You, you know, addition, you concatenate the branching programs in parallel, multiplication, you concatenate them sequentially, so if you have, uh, if f was uh, g plus h, and these were branching programs, and what you'll do is you'll put, yeah, maybe you'll, you'll just have some trivial thing here. So this will be the formula for g, and this will be for h. Okay, this will do the sum because the paths are disjoint. If you have products, then you'll do something like this. So it's very easy to see that, uh, you know, you don't lose size. The size of a bunch of programs simulating a formula is, is not larger. Sometimes can be smaller. And so the basic question is, I am cheating a bit. There is a homogeneity issue, which I am skipping, but, you know, that's essentially it. And so what Nissan is doing is actually proving low bounds on the size of bunch of programs proving, uh, uh, you know, computing, let's say, the determinant. Or any function, and what's the proof technique? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we, we think that it's strictly so. In the general, we have no separation. Uh, well, no, no, sorry. Uh, well, I mean, anyway, in the general setting, we have no separation. We have separations for some restricted models, but uh, yeah, we don't know. In general, we don't know in the commutative cases there are. Larger. So one, one good example is the uh, determinant itself. The determinant has polynomial size branching programs. It's a commutative setting, right? Because basically matrix multiplication. 
and for formulas, the best we know is n to the log n. So, yeah. And what's uh, Norm's idea? So the way I defined it, this will be a homogeneous polynomial, and if there are n layers here, one, two, three, uh, up to n, then this will be a polynomial of degree n, and we can cut it at any point, any point k, and then just compare, it's like a communication complexity normal, if you want. Uh, look at what happens on this side and look at what happens on, on this side. And what do I mean, look at what happens? We can uh, uh, create a matrix for, every, for a polynomial f. We can create a matrix mk of f, where here we write all, so we are in the non-commutative setting. We write all, all k monomials. Just list all k monomials. And here we list all n minus k. So um, I mean degree n minus k monomials. monomials. And you know, if we have some product, we have x3, x7, x1 here, and here we have uh, x2, x4. Here we write the coefficient of f, uh, the coefficient in f of, um, of the monomial, which is the product of this by this, x3, x7, x1, x2, x4. OK? Just write the, so it's a very natural representation of the polynomial as a, uh, as a matrix. Just write it like this. And what Norm uh, proves is that the width of this layer, you know, this layer, this uh, uh, LK, the layer K, LK is at least the length of MK. And this is true for every K. It's obvious. I mean, in fact, it proves a stronger result. It proves that it's equal. But the fact that it's at least, I mean, if it was smaller, then, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Bill. This is the definition, all n minus k monomials. So all k monomials zero, all n minus k monomials zero. So you just have a, the matrix is filled basically with all monomials, all possible monomials, and you write just the coefficient. Just like we do in communication complexity. This matrix is called mk of x. And now you have to, so this is really easy. And once you have this, you see that uh, you can get a lower bound by proving rent lower bounds. And right now bounds for the term scale determinant, you can check and see that it, it's uh, two to the n. But it's even simpler for the palindrome example, because the palindrome example will be just an identity matrix. So it's really easy. OK, so that's, uh, that's norms lower bound. And now, what? Because, OK, the lower bound, I hope, is clear. Because, I mean, what happens is that F can be, once you split it, F can be written as a product of two matrices, what is computed here and what is computed here. And, yeah, the rank of a product is. Uh, uh, and equality is that if you had some more than you needed here, more than the rank, you could, uh, you know, by expressing, uh, by taking a basis and expressing the, uh, redundant thing in terms of you could cut it shorter, so there is no, there is never a need to do this. I should say that this idea was uh, uh, key in uh, there is a paper of uh, Razen Spilka, which takes non-commutative arithmetic branching programs and tests, you know, does PIT for them, tests whether they are basically zero or not, and this critically uses the fact that the minimal layer, each layer, uh, is at most the rank of this. Okay, so. Uh, the the there is nothing non commutative here. These are entries in the field. These are the coefficients of the matrix. Oh, this is no nothing. Is like yeah, what's non commutative is nice, <laughs> but you know. 
this, this is ordered, and that's, that's critical. In fact, we'll get to this in a... Okay, so let me tell you uh, how to get circuit lower bound. Uh, in this paper with uh, Hubes and the Odayot, uh, we developed some uh, structure theorem for non-commutative circuits, similar to what I told you in the case of commutative. I told you about here field, you know, uh, normal form for, non for commutative circuits. There is one for non-commutative circuits, which actually is more, you know, naturally, you can say more about non-commutative uh, circuits because they are more restricted. And uh, from this characterization, we developed it, uh, we simplified it as much as we could to arrive at a concrete, you know, another lower bound question, which is, in fact, looks very different than the original and is very appealing. So I want to describe it to you, and that's the sum of squares, sum of squares problem. Okay? About the sum of squares problem. I'll, I'll tell you two problems that you can prove and get exponential lower bound for determinant or permanent in, uh, uh, sorry, for the, yeah, in the non-commutative case, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the sum of squares problem. So if I wrote to you, so I'll write a sum, some identities. This is the identity for n equals one. Uh, X one uh, squared is X one squared. This would not be too interesting. So let me write another identity for n equals two. Uh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to write though. Something a little more complicated, y1 squared, x1, y1 squared, this is, ah, sorry, now we are back to commutative. We are back to the commutative world. The problems I'll ask you are about commutative uh, yeah, polynomial. So this is trivial. What is the n equals two? So here we multiplied squares, let's multiply sums of two squares. So if I write x1 squared plus x2 squared times y1 squared plus y2 squared, can I write it as a sum of two squares? g1 squared plus g2 squared. And in general, what I would like, you know, this uh, bilinear form in x and y. So let me specify, well, let me show you what it is. Do you know what it is? Anybody can tell me how to write this product as a sum of two squares? Well, these are, uh, the GIs are bilinear form. Very good. So, and it's clear also where you took it, right? So it's X1 plus um, X1 y1 plus x2 y2 squared plus x1 y2 minus x2 y1 squared. And it's clear where it's coming from. It's coming from uh, the multiplication of complex numbers, right? It's the norm of x1 plus i x2 and y1 plus i. That's great. So then this was discovered by Pascal, I think, very early on in the, in the 1700s. And then in the 1800s, uh, Euler discovered something amazing, which is a four square identity, so x1 square. What? Euler? Euler, sorry, yeah, yeah, 17, right, yeah. No, sorry, this was known, I don't know, in, to the Indians in 600. I don't know, Brahma Gupta was, uh, anyway, maybe even the Babylonians. Knew. This is in the 1700s. That's uh, Euler, x4 squared. basically g1 squared plus g4 squared, where these, each of the gi's are bilinear forms in the variables. Uh, I'm not going to write it down, but it's, yeah. What is the n here, like, is it the number of uh, the, How many squares we are adding? How many squares? So it's the sum of n squares times the sum of n squares. And turns out, you know, for three, there is, you know, nobody found such identity. And they were either discovered this identity. And then, of course, you know, uh, people got excited, and uh, uh, I guess this is uh, 
Kubit or Kelly, maybe Kelly, or maybe it was several people in parallel dis discovered that similarly the sum up to eight of the axis. So that was the uh, yeah cool. So of course then everybody tried to extend it and you can tell what happened, right? What happened? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So the whole it's no more. Some who know about division algebras recognize that this is about norms of uh, quaternions, this is about norms of octonions, and there are no more such, uh, such division algebras. So uh, that's where it stops. But for us, no, not this is proper, something else is proper. Uh, yeah, this is what? Yeah, this is not, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a second what's topological. But you know, fine, this is just a source for a question. So you can ask for general n, if I tell you that if I look at the sum of s x i squared, n of them, x y i squared, n of them, I definitely I can write it as a sum, I go from 1 to k of z i squared, where z i's are bilinear. Right? But not with n terms, with n square terms. I can open it up and I get the sum of x i y j squared. So let's uh, let's denote by s of n the smallest k k needed. Okay. And in fact it's good to, to put a field here or even a ring. Uh, And so what, what uh, observation, uh, they, it was studied over the reals and uh, um, in fact, what if I don't write anything, it's, well, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, S of n is the smallest n squared is obvious and it's at least n is obvious. But uh, two, two important theorems, one, one of Radon and Horvitz, is that you can improve the upper bound into this. So this trivial way is not the best way. This is Radon, Radon and Horvitz. What? Uh, this is the same mid 1800s, mid 1800s. Every, yeah, so this is uh, even, let me, um, okay, so let me first talk about the real. This, yeah, this upper, but so let me separate them. Okay, good. So this is Radon and Horowitz, and this is over the integer event. Okay. <laughs> no, no, with zero one, I mean, these are zero one, it actually will be with zero one coefficient. Zero plus minus one coefficient. Yeah. yeah. And on the other hand, uh, S R of N is greater than 2 minus little or 1 n. And that's the best lower bound on what? What is this rule of the field or the ring or anything like that? So what does it mean? Yeah, I mean, where does your s be, s be the most simple? So you see, the left hand side has 0, 1 coefficient. Okay. I can express it, but so it can, it makes sense over any field. I want to express it as uh, bilinear forms over you know, whatever field, that's what I'm writing here. And so if you then switch to field or switch what rule coefficients you're allowed to use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it may change. It okay. may change. Yeah. But I'm saying that uh, if you, even if you restrict to integers, there is a non trivial upper bound. Even if you restrict to 0, 1 plus minus 1 coefficient, there is a non trivial upper bound. It comes from Clifford algebra, those who know. And on the other hand, this is the uh, James theorem. Theorem, and this comes from uh, basically techniques of algebraic topology. There is a reason why, why 
topology enters here, but I will not explain. So this uh, may seem like an algebraic problem. It has a topological uh, equivalence framework. It has a linear algebra equivalence framework, uh, you know, sort of way to ask it. Um, but the point is, anyway, people studied it. This is mathematics. It has nothing to do with circuits. It just, you know, uh, seems like a basic question. So what's the, what is this, uh, what is this function? So in the in this paper with the in fact it's sort of two papers with the Pupil Diop and uh, so the first theorem is that it's really good to study these things because if S C over the complex numbers of n is greater than n to the 1 plus epsilon for any fixed positive epsilon, then let's say permanent, the Cayley permanent, Cayley permanent requires a non-commutative circuit. So this will prove exponential over. The second thing we prove, we tried to prove it, we couldn't. Uh, but we could prove such a lower bound over the integrals. I wouldn't say it's indicative because the integer case is simpler. In some sense, it's a monotone version of the, even the real. It's some, 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 some sense a monotone version of this question. But anyway, it's a natural question. All the tools of math are available. The best they can do is this. But yeah, we need just a slightly superlinear lower bound. But do we know that uh, this is complex numbers we can do better? Like if no, no, no. There is nothing better than this over any, yeah, it's not, yeah. Maybe. Uh, Uh, very small, something like, uh, yeah, so, so, so some people are studying it, especially over the integers. Um, yeah, maybe 12 or 13, something like this. Yeah, so some people start. Um, okay, I wanted to tell you of another, yeah. Uh, what's the one thing more than the base factor? No, nothing, uh, well, uh, over DF2, the question does make sense, but. Uh, Except for that. Uh, yeah, no, nothing is known. And uh, I want to tell you, so let me quickly tell you another question, which comes out of a related characterization of non-commutative circuits, which I also like a lot. And uh, this is, uh, has to do with, uh, it's related to some, you know, in, uh, Ran has a paper in which he shows that tensor lower bounds will give, you know, other lower bounds, like formula lower bounds, it's in the commutative domain. Uh, I want to tell you, give you a tensor sort of uh, version uh, of this, uh, of a question here that uh, um, maybe it's easier, maybe it's easier than this, it's different. And uh, uh, I should just mention that, uh, you know, so we have this version and then uh, Ran at least is working on other uh, uh, characterizations of non-commutative circuits which lead to other problems, some of this nature and some of different nature that, yeah, well maybe we are close to proving this uh, arithmetic circuit lower bound. At least I think we both have some feeling that <laughs> we are close. Uh, the community, I mean. Okay, so, uh, so let, let me notice that this is a, what we have here is a, degree four polynomial, right, for which we are asking a simple expression. And I want to stay with degree four polynomials, but now I have uh, instead, so here we had nx and ny variables. I now will allow myself also z and w, so we have xi, yi, zi, and wi, which are 
And uh, I want to look at polynomials in multilinear polynomials in this. So these are tensors. So just uh, x, y, z, w uh, is a tensor by which I mean a multilinear polynomial in, in this uh, in these variables, and we are looking for hard tensors in the following sense. Uh, this is the, the tensor I'll suggest. So here, for example, uh, one such tensor, let me call it A, A, X, Y, Z, W. It's one we like and related to the sum of squares. It's just a sum over all i and j from 1 to n, X, I, Y, J, Z, I, W, J. And now, uh, you can take a tensor. In fact, lots of the, uh, you know, we need tensor lower bounds. And uh, for example, co uh, geometric complexity theory is obtaining some tensor lower bounds. They say the ones on matrix multiplication that were recently obtained, uh, and even Strassen's uh, one. And nobody knows how to deal with tensor rank. In fact, right? It's anti-hard and uh, it has no properties and so on. The, the, the main source of information about tensor rank comes with flattening the tensor and making it, uh, you know, like a matrix. So it's clear. So I didn't define the rank of a tensor. It's just a rank of a tensor is, uh, you know, <laughs> what's the smallest number of rank one tensors that you can write it as, and uh, a tensor is of rank one if it's a product of linear functions, one in this, one in this. Uh, so we'll care about rank, but rank, uh, you know, the source of information about rank comes from uh, flattening the tensor. So let me say what I mean by T, X, Y, Z, W. It's just a matrix, which is now will be N squared by N squared, in which I write here all monomials, you know, x1, y1, x1, y2. And here, it's just like norms matrix. And here I write, uh, w, you know, z1, w1 to zn, wn. And here I write the coefficient, coefficient of t at this monomial. OK? So that's a way to represent, that's a way to flatten this four-dimensional tensors into a two-dimensional one. Okay, I can also do the same. I can flatten it in other directions. So I can look at the flattening of y, y z, let's say, x w, and that will be, you know, I can do it. Okay, so notice. Let me make a simple claim. A. When I res when I look at it at x y z w, what matrix is it? diagonal because ij and ij exactly so this is i n squared and in fact it's the same if i flatten it in this direction because this is j i and j so it's also a uh, y z x w okay so that's how this tensor looks like when we flatten it and now here's the question can you write a question can you write A as B plus C as sum of two tensors so that the rank, now it's at a matrix because I'm going to flatten them, the rank of B when I flatten it in the x, y, z, w direction, and the rank of C when I flatten it in y, z, x, w direction, so that these two ranks are small. And, uh, okay, you can try to try to do that. I mean, it cannot be done if you do just one, because this has rank n squared. And the, the theorem is that if r is less than n to the 1 plus epsilon, just the same as before, if you read, you know, then as before, we, you get exponential in n, uh, a lower bound for the Cayley determinant. K determinant. Yeah, definitely. I expect it to be true. 
you may, you know, you may not like this particular tensor. You can make your own tensor. If it's an explicit tensor, you can describe the same lower bound with that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I expect it to be true. I would love to see a construction that, yeah. If, uh, sorry, thank you. If R has to be bigger, then, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, of course, this should remind you of other, uh, you know, problems that we cannot solve. The rigidity problem, for example, which has to write a matrix as a sum of two matrices, one is low rank, one is sparse, is on some of some similar nature, but anyway, yeah. Uh, it doesn't imply anything direct about the tensor rank that I know. Yeah. M maybe it does in some. Okay. So, good. Let me questions about it so far. Okay. So, now let me move to the more main things. I did want to state that it's uh, open problems in the hope that you'll try to work on them. So I want to talk now about, uh, we, are, we are back to the non-commutative. Non-commutative. Well, then I, I want to talk about completeness and about uh, balancing formulas in both settings. And, uh, and uh, talk about the non-commutative lower bounds over the um, well, both completeness and uh, lower bounds over the uh, division ring. So I want to talk about first about this polynomial ring, and uh, then I'll talk about this. So before I do that, I uh, want to remind you what this is, and some basic theorems that we will guess we will need. Um, okay. So remember uh, we talked about rational expressions with divisions. I'll remind you, uh, we can start writing, uh, so things are not as nice as in the commutative world. You can write uh, expressions which involve addition, multiplication, and inversion. And uh, they don't simplify to the nice form of ratios of polynomials as they do in the commutative setting. So there's some examples like x inverse plus y inverse or I don't know, x, y, x, x uh, are not something like p over q. Cannot be written like this. You can convince yourself for any non-commutative polynomials that you, you will put there. It's just impossible. And I told you also that uh, there is a m more serious problem. It's a problem of uh, a nested inversion. So I gave this example. You have inversion and then inversion again. So this is even worse than this. Here at least you can hope that there is a sum of you know, expressions and there is just one inverse in each. Um, but that's... Uh, so in this case, it turns out that this is x inverse minus x plus y inverse, which shows that there are non-trivial identities in this, uh, in this uh, well, I'll, I'll say in a second that it's a field. Uh, there are non-trivial identities, uh, but this you can easily prove that was identity. I mentioned it last time. And on the other hand, if you do the same with other variables. You, you have more variables, let's say z, y inverse, w inverse. So also here we have nested inversion. It's impossible to eliminate. So for this inverse height, it's true. 
So, uh, you know, this is, you, you can try to prove this. It's, yeah, it's not easy at all. Just suppose two, uh, I mean, just two inversions to prove that it's not simplified. It's not clear even what tools to use. I mentioned last time that, uh, in fact, this was proved and more general theorem was proved. The one basic theorem I want to, to remember, which we'll need soon. Uh, this is, I think, the mid-90s or late-90s. Is that uh, inverse height is uh, from the infinite hierarchy. Okay, there are, there are expressions which require, which cannot be simplified to more than you know, uh, height h for every h. And moreover, the proof is, uh, you know, uh, gives, gives much more. And what it proves is the following. Uh, x n inverse. So by which I mean just n by n, yeah, the n by n matrices. Inverting an n by n matrices, uh, so every entry here, so let me just keep it time. When I inverting n by n matrix of variables, of distinct n squared variables, uh, you look at the rational expressions you get in the, in the entries, and it turns out that each of them requires inverse height. So this will be very useful for us. Uh, let me just uh, remind you uh, what I said last time. Uh, I'm, I don't want to get into too much detail into the, you know, there, there are lots of things known about this, uh, you know, this field. I just want to state that it's a, it's a field and there are uh, at least two ways, there are more than two ways to view this field that are useful. Uh, we will not use them much today, but uh, you know, so, yeah, it's not commutative. Yeah, how is it a field? It's a field in that it's a division ring. Every element that's not zero has an inverse, and multiplication is not commutative. There is a, you know, you're used to, you know, every, everything, <laughs> every time you, <laughs> we went into this esoteric world that mathematicians, many mathematicians don't even consider. When you learn what a field is, multiplication is commutative. In our world, since we even got here to polynomials. No, but it's that's the only difference, that multiplication is not commutative. Yeah, that's right. In the, in the up, yeah, if you write the axioms, they al already, you know, postulate uh, commutativity of multiplication. Yeah, in the science world, we do, if you have a commutative in your field, it's still important. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, no, no, I'm uh, going to talk about test, uh, yeah, testing. Uh, this is a polynomial identity testing. I mean, rational, so checking this kind of thing is the same as PIT, but in the rational world. So this is what I called RIT over there, rational identity testing. I want to talk about it. <coughs> so I just want to tell you uh, how to think of elements in this field. It's sort of useful. Uh, and there are two ways to think of elements in this field. So this is called the free free skew field. And there are two definitions of the elements in it. Uh, or the, I said there are more, one by Amistur and another by Kron. And Amistur's uh, definition of the, you know, what are the elements of this field? They are just these rational expressions. So it's sort of bizarre, but uh, you know, long before complexity theory, there's a definition of algebraic objects by computation. Except that you know, we see that some expressions are the same, and so you want to say when are two expressions equivalent? At least define it. If you don't, even if you cannot tell it, it was not clear that it's decidable. So two rational expressions. So these are you know, each one of these um, is a rational expression, and uh, Amitsur calls 
צורה שונה זה אקספרשן אקוויוולנט, so they are on, on some n variables, if for every k and for every m1 up to mn in We are over some field again, which uh, is fine for everything we do. It can, can be uh, very different ones, so it, we don't need to specify it at this point. Anyway, two expressions are the same if r of this vector a equals, so you can evaluate rational expressions on matrices, right? So you evaluate them. Uh, it's the same as s of a. For every such a, of course, there is a potential problem because we have division. Somebody asked me, what do we do with division by zero? So if, if there's a division by zero when you're evaluating one of these expressions, then the expression is not defined on that input. So some, some inputs are not defined. So this is whenever defined. So when you put this equivalent structure on the set of rational expressions, I'm not saying it's testable, but it's fine. Then you get this. Then you need to prove that it's a it's a field. It's a non-trivial, <coughs> highly non-trivial proof that it's a field. Every non-zero element, every element which is not equivalent to zero in this definition, is inversely. That's what I said. If it's not, you try to invert something that's not invertible, then it's not defined. Yeah. So there's a, yeah. So whenever defined, you want them to be equal. Yeah. So the proof that the experiment that the matrices are being defined. Yeah. Yeah. The elements, the the entries of the matrix are field elements, so they commute. Yeah. 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 It's a, well, you are getting it somewhere where I didn't want to get. It's a, it's a, no, it's a, it's a very good question. So what, what uh, <coughs> Ed is suggesting is not putting here field elements, matrices with field elements. You can put here what's called generic matrices. So just make matrices of commuting variables. And it's sort of equivalent to ask that these will be the same in this, you know, abstract sense. So you just want for, for every k when you uh, substitute uh, generic matrices on both sides, you get uh, the same. It's a very good thing to do. In fact, it turns out that uh, it turns out that um, these things will be always defined. Always. Okay. So. Unless you get, I mean, uh, unless your rational expression just computes something that's identically zero and then tries to invert it. So if your rational expression is, let's say, minimal, then it will always be defined. But that's a deep theorem of Amistur, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not going there. But anyway, it's a very good idea to think about generic matrices. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so you, why other ring? Why not other ring? Great. Turns out that this is as good as putting all rings there. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, it's equivalent. A cons definition, which we will need in a second, is uh, is very different. Is it uh, uh, has a more concrete interpretation of what are the elements of this pre skew field, and actually to prove that they are the same field also takes work. But uh, here's what it says: uh, take any matrix of uh, Take any matrix of polynomials. So consider I should call it different. Right? So if assume that B, you know, it's an n by n, uh, is some matrix of polynomials, P i j. So each of these guys is in R algebra. Why did I write A and not F? I don't know. Uh, Take a matrix of polynomials and look at its inverse. And you can look at its inverse. Its inverse, well, if it exists, 
then uh, you know we'll have as entries rational expressions you would imagine in these variables and what Kohn shows is that these three few fields um, is precisely the set of inverses of all matrices which are invertible. So it's, um, it's uh, uh, precisely all entries of inverses. Invertible B. Okay. Uh, so we will, the proof of this, I'll, I'll do something which will resemble one of the proofs of this. Um, so that's the other connection we'll need. So we'll need the Rettenauer theorem and this uh, something. Our polynomial. Yeah, so, so here is an example. We will we'll need this example maybe soon. So suppose I, I have a, uh, you know, whatever, x, y, x, y, z, 0, two by two matrix of uh, polynomials in these non-commuting variables. And I look at its inverse, and it is x inverse, y in, uh, z inverse, and here we have minus x in, uh, inverse y to inverse. Right? So the inverse contains its rational expressions. If you, if you, what? Yeah, because I may, yeah, that's the rational expression. Yeah. And if you, if it there was, that's an easy case with triangular matrix. If there was nothing, if, if this was a W, then we would have nested inversions. Okay, so uh, good. So we have the uh, background. So let me do one before the break. Uh, yeah. No, as I said, it requires a, a non-trivial theorem. Yeah, you can. It's good for for us to think about both uh, both worlds or both definitions. Yeah, it turns out, okay, so completion of the completion of the non-commutative ring of polynomials, uh, this one, uh, is not unique, but there is a unique maximal skew field, which is called universal or free, and this is it. This is the largest. Sometimes you, you can localize non-commutative polynomials in several ways, and then they will all appear at subfields of this. Yeah, all of these are non-trivial theorems, and I also don't know their proof. Uh, actually, let's let's take a break. Let's take now a, a five-minute break, roughly. Okay. Yeah. But we, we, we can discuss it. Uh, you, you're right. It's a non there's something that can be viewed as circular in this definition because what are the, the entries to which you've been defined? But you define them inductively. And I'll, I'll show exactly how you define them or roughly how you define them. And uh, uh, to do this, we have to go back. So we, we are going to, I stated one theorem. Uh, um, you know, which we proved, but actually follows from uh, Kohn and uh, more precisely with Malcolm Kohn's result, you know, which simplified Kohn's construction uh, that says that uh, X inverse uh, is complete for formula size, for so now we are uh, we are over you know, we are doing with division um, for formulas 
in uh, f of t. And uh, more precisely, what it means? Well, we have our projection, our linear projection, right? So we, we what what this says is that uh, if you have uh, if f is a formula. Size s, uh, then uh, f is uh, x inverse in some position. In fact, we'll take it in position one n. Uh, sorry, one. Um, okay, so let me write it more precisely. Then the, there exists an S by S matrix, or maybe it's two S by two S matrix. Um, X such that F is the end, the top rightmost entry of F. So one F. Okay. So this uh, this is a completeness result, and it should remind you of valiance completeness result, of course. Valiance completeness result says that uh, you know that determinant. I'm, I'm now even over the commutative. Uh, well, so valiant is uh, is for uh, the usual. Uh, uh, ring of polynomials, the commutative ring of polynomials, and uh, in this paper with uh, Hubesh and Yehudayov, we did it for the non-commutative case, which is it's almost the same proof. Okay, the determinant is complete for formulas. In the same sense, uh, so if, uh, if f is a formula of size s, s, there exists an uh, s by s matrix, x, such that f is the determinant of t. Right? So this, yeah. Yeah, so that's a very good point, and this uh, uh, connection is not as, as tight for the non-commutative case. However, uh, if you look at the proof, and we'll do it in a second, the matrices you get are very special. They are almost triangular, and for these matrices, you can compute it. So if you, de if you define the determinant for nearly triangular matrices, then you, you would recover the you know, near completeness, the quasi-polynomial. Uh, yeah, so yeah, small, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what I'll do is remind you how this is done. How many people have seen this proof? Not, yeah, most most of you didn't. Yeah, the Berkeley education again is. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Say anything about Weizmann? <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's just beautiful and, uh, and simple, and probably was known to mathematicians uh, anyway before Valiant. But uh, it's really, it's really, uh, you know, uh, another way in which the determinant function is so is so important. Besides, it's important in linear algebra. Uh, and then I'll tell you what changes here. Okay, so. Uh, Right, so how do you do it? I mean, what would you do? Suppose I gave you a formula. So suppose this formula is F. Well, how can F look like? Well, it's either the sum of two formulas, G and H, or it's the product of two formulas, G and H. And what I'll say is it will be true both in the commutative and non-commutative worlds. Okay. All right, so suppose now I, I give you now uh, I give you the matrices x sub g and I give you x sub h. 
How would you construct x sub f? Let's say it was a product sigma. What would you do? You want now a matrix whose determinant is a product, right, of the, the previous two. And you already know that this is, the determinant of this is G, the determinant of this is H. You want a matrix whose, <laughs> yeah. So here you just, so here's XF, it will be XG. The determinant and put zero zero. The determinant of this, the product. Yeah, that's good. That's the easy kind, easy way. How to do some? Add. Yeah, it adds. So just like formula side adds, uh, it's, uh, this side adds, and there's nothing changes. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's no, no, it doesn't matter. That's a square matrix. That's a square matrix. It's not the same dimension. If the size of this was S1 and this was S2, then this will be a block of S1 and this will be a block of S2. So the product of them, well, A, you can't multiply them by because they are not of the same size. Oh. But uh, it's not even what you want to do. You want to describe a matrix whose determinant is the, f the function computed by your formula. No, no, what do you mean? No, they are not of the same size. Yeah, what no, do you mean? If they're, but it's, uh, it's here, you know, they are never of the same. It's not, it's not a good way to think. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, no, but uh, I, I don't mind allowing polynomial entries if you want to. That's not the issue. In fact, here they will not be, but you can always get rid of uh, That's not the issue. It's uh, just the wrong thing to do, and that's the natural thing to do. <laughs> because of the... <laughs> The properties of determinant, and uh, it's the right thing to do. Only that uh, you know, what do you do with addition? Anybody sees how to? <laughs> they are not of the same size. <laughs> so this is really cool. So what you do is the following. So you, you assume, I mean, it's like you, as usual. You, you you have an inductive proof. You want stronger induction. So let us also assume that all our matrices will, will have it for x a and uh, you know for these guys and uh, and we'll we'll conclude it for the bigger one that uh, they have a special structure. So they all have a structure like this. They have this is the main diagonal and be below the main diagonal you have ones and below that you have zero. Let's assume. Okay. Yeah, everything can be, so there will be, you know. I mean, eventually it will be variables and constants, right? Because the inductive construction starts from. Uh, um, so this is, uh, this changes already multiplication because that definitely doesn't have this property. It has zero here. So even if these two have the, that, structure, we won't get the structure, but that's easily fixable. We can put one here, nothing changes. The determinant still doesn't change. So that's good. So we can maintain this inductive structure from, for this. There is another thing to check, by the way, because here the base case in the original construction was just a one by one uh, square matrix with a variable. But if you want it to look like this, you really have to, you know, the base case will probably look like one uh, xi. Uh, sorry, it's not what I want to write. One, one, one. That's the base case. Okay, the determinant of this is xi, and it has its uh, sub-diagonal. Okay, how do you do this? Uh, once you have this inductive structure, it's not really difficult. Okay, so let me explain. So you have here xg. And it looks like this. So it has its uh, zeros and one, ones. I mean, I, I, you do the same. <laughs> it's sort of amazing. You do the same. So here you have one. 
so this is a in zero zero this x sub h and you want to force the determinants to add and it's uh, you know what you do is uh, basically put add another row and column so that's uh, what so you are you are going to build you know you are going to make it slightly bigger by one that's why it's not really s by s will be some like two s by two s so you add another row and column and this uh, other row and column is going to force this uh, chain so it's just a sort of a programming with the terminants kind of trick so you put here a one you put here a one you put here a one and you put here a one and the rest are zeros and if you try to expand the determinant you see that if you have to take this one then you are forced to uh, you know so you erase this so you are forced to oh, <laughs> let me not do it uh, so expanded the determinant you either take this one or this one one will give you the uh, determinant of uh, g and the other of h and you'll be forced so it's it's very simple what good so uh, for all I'll say it's not yeah it's yeah uh, when, when you expand here you are not missing the row it's this and this of course you miss I mean it's like yeah, the usual expansion of the term only an India complains justifiably that uh, the invariance is not maintained so let's just switch this and this row <laughs> Okay, and that's it. So, I mean, you, you can verify that it works. So what happens, uh, what happens here? Exactly the same thing happens here. Exactly the same. There is an inductive construction. And this inductive construction uh, now has to work. So now, now we have, uh, you know, for the proof we, proof we need some, structure for this axis and we need to check it for plus for times and for inverse right we, because we have inversion in our circuit and uh, I'm not going to do it I'm going to give you an example which will be based on what I've written in the corner over there yeah this inversion over there so suppose I'll just do the case of multiplication so suppose you have s is uh, g times h and we already have xt and sh now they don't have to they will not have the special structure but remember that the entry we care about is the right top right entry that that contains uh, the value of the function so for g and for h and we want the same for f now using this inverse formula you can really see that if i want to generate a matrix for uh, for f what I'll do again the same exact thing so I'll put here xg I'll put here xh and I need to put something here that will make sure that this entry and this entry get to the in the inverse in the inverse will get here and it's easy to do you just put one here and zeros everywhere zeros everywhere else and the way to see is that the inverse of this in the corner is f is just by looking at what happens here so the corner entry will be in this part and what I'm doing is uh, multiply the inverses and bringing them by looking at this entry bringing them to the top right position so it's uh, you know again programming with inverses it's just a uh, uh, so this is a construction that's the inductive construction you construct all the elements of the of the field by by applying this kind of operations with uh, with the arithmetic operations you have um, it's more complicated with the addition and with the and with inverse but it's not much more complicated it's a couple of lines to verify that it works so it's boring I'm not going to do it okay 
but uh, I just want to remind you that uh, this is one uh, this is one way to uh, or one reason why inverse takes the role of determinant in the non-symmetric equation. Okay. I want to prove the low bound. I want to prove this uh, that uh, and it will be very simple as you'll see. I ju I'm just reminding you that we also had For circuits, inverse is easy. Unlike the de determinants in the non commutative setting, inverse is easy to take. So that gives a separation, just analogous to non separation between circuit, exponential gap between circuit and formulas. No, actually, matrix multiplication is the, yeah. Yeah, it's not hard to say. I mean, just the recursive definition of inverse gives it this. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's matrix multiplication. Uh, Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, assume for a second, and this is what we'll prove in uh, one minute, assume formulas uh, were, could be balanced. So here's another theorem, which I'll prove uh, in a second. Uh, v of, so for any, for any rational expression, uh, a small sum t times log. Every rational expression. Okay, for any element of this Q field, the formula complexity, you know, if we have a formula for it, we can balance it. So, first of all, you would believe it, and uh, if it's true, uh, it's uh, slightly more complicated than I'll mention why, uh, but it's basically essentially the same proof. But suppose we have it. Then I claim that this is very, this very easily follows from Rattenauer's theorem. Because maybe I should put the omega in because I didn't say what this constant is. Uh, so this implies that if L of something is less than, uh, less, less than, um, so if, if it was less than 2 to the O of n, let's say x inverse, it would mean that the depth of x inverse is below n. But this would mean that the inverse height, how many, how many uh, nested inverses can you fit? It's most the depth. And that would be a contradiction to what an theorem. Okay. So the invariant of inverse height is used here in the this low bound, and you know, I, you know, probably it itself is not the way to prove circuit low bounds, but there are other invariants in this world, and uh, hopefully they can be used. Okay. So it's very easy once you have this very powerful theorem. Now, how do you balance expressions? Uh, l let me not do it. I mean, just, well, let, let me say one minute's worth of it. I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen balancing formulas. Uh, you have some really big and complicated tree, and you want to balance it. So you find the node which partitions the, which partitions the computation, you know, it just breaks up the tree into two roughly equal size uh, things. So let's say this was G and this was H. So H is what's computed here. 
and g is what's computed if we put a new variable g in this place. Okay, g is the new variable. variable. Now, now what you want to do is to take this uh, thing with z, and you want to take this h, and somehow combine them by a small gadget that will compute f as you want it. And the key thing is that in the commutative case, which is the easiest case, so in the commutative case, what happens here, z appears only once, it's a new variable. So what you get, you know, it has a path in this tree, and what kind of function is computed if we, you know, uh, sort of all the other entries as constants, it will be just a linear function. So here you'll get something like ax plus b. In fact, this function can be written as the ax plus b, where a and b are expressions in the other variables. And inductively, you use the fact that you can balance them. And that's uh, what you do here. And then, of course, you would plug, uh, you know, once you know this, you can plug h here. So that will be this, uh, this gadget. In the non-commutative polynomial case, it's almost the same, only that, uh, you know, multiplications from the left and from the right are different, so you'll get something like ax b plus c. I mean, what you need to verify about these expressions is just that they, you know, compose with the operations of the circuit, plus, sign, and, uh, and uh, also that they compose with themselves, composing linear function with the linear function. Also here, it's the same. And what happens uh, when you have divisions, you have to find the normal form. What's an analog of a linear function in the non-commutative setting? It's not obvious that, uh, you know, I mean, there is a natural guess. It's not obvious that it will work, but it does work. And this is the fractional linear function. It turns out that I should call them Z. Z. So it, it turns out that in this order, C, Z plus B inverse is a good inductive uh, you know, structure. And you just propagate everything and everything works. Yeah? No, it doesn't. No, everything. Uh, it doesn't matter if there are nested inverses or not. This compose this uh, uh, representation of this uh, recursive thing. You know, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. It composes with all the operations, including division. You have to check that the inverse of something like this is of this form. That's easy, but there are other things that are more complicated to check, like addition. Uh, but but it does. So, yeah. Okay. So this was the uh, this was how you prove the lower bound. So good. Now I want to talk about questions. Sorry. Uh, Okay, so I want to talk about the really the main, uh, uh, the frustrating part of this, which uh, and was rational identity testing and uh, elimination of division. And it turns out magically they are really, <laughs> really um, connected. So before I, I uh, talk about uh, uh, you know, rational identity testing, I want to talk about uh, polynomial identity testing. I mentioned already last time that, uh, uh, you know, so in, in now we are, for polynomials, non-commutative polynomials, PIT is in BPP. There is a fast probabilistic algorithm to check it. So I want to show to show it to you. And what it follows, so we know this, of course, with the Schwarz zipper, et cetera, in the commutative case. Uh, but the commutative case doesn't help very much because we know that expressions like xy minus yx are non-commutative polynomials which are not identically zero, but whatever you plug in, if we plug field elements, it would be identically zero. So that's not good enough. And of course, the natural thing to do is to plug matrices in here. So the question is, what size matrices should we plug in so we get non-zero? Once you get non-zero, it's really easy to show that uh, 
with high probability you'll get non-zero if, if they are random. But you want to show that sometimes you get non-zero evaluation. If you took this expression and plug two by two matrices, almost any, you'll see that it doesn't vanish. So that's, that's uh, what we are capitalizing on. And the uh, theorem that uh, underlies it all is the Amitsur Mitsur Elavitsky, which has two parts. It tells you exactly what size matrices will vanish for what degree of a polynomial. Okay? So it says um, there exists a polynomial phi of degree 2n which vanishes. It's a set of variables is identically zero for every uh, x1, whatever, how many there are in mn of f. Okay, so the, the ring of matrices, n by n matrices, has a polynomial identity. There is an identity of degree only 2n, which vanishes on all of them. And uh, for every p of degree 2n minus 1, so maybe I should have called them a matrices better. Uh, there exists an a such that p of a is not identical. And it's interesting, Eddie, re relevant to what you asked, that it's not identically zero if you plugged in here, you know, gener generic matrices, matrices of variables. Not only will it be not zero, it will be invertible matrices. Always. That's a theorem of Amitsu. So it's another. I'm going to tell you even what it is. So you, yeah. So I, I'm going to show you a polynomial identity for which vanishes on all n by n matrices. And I want to point out that this is a polynomial identity for one by one matrices. This polynomial vanishes on all one by one matrices, right? So what's the generalization of it? I mean, you could even guess it. Anybody wants to guess it? It's a polynomial of degree two, two for one by one matrices, right? It's an identity of degree two for one by one matrices. And the generalization is what's called the standard polynomial. polynomial S S1. So let me let me define Sn and we are going to use S2n for n by n by n. But just what Sn is, is like the determinant, only we don't have a matrix, we have just <laughs> n variables. So we do what we have to do, sigma sine of sigma, the product of x sigma of i. It's a polynomial, it's just all monomials in all permutations and take them with the sign, that's it. Uh, and the claim is, so what they proved uh, is that S2n of A1, A2n, okay, because that's the number of, you know, where A is Mn of S. Is zero. So what's the okay? Any matrices you take. What's the proof of this? This says yeah. Sorry. That's true, yeah, it's, it, it works, yeah, that's true. It works just for, uh, uh, I would say, yeah, polynomial degree, polynomials, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, 
So what's it? So, so there are several proofs, and I said they're quite different. And let me show you the sketch of the of the nicest or graph theoretic uh, one, which is sort of similar to the original one, but they didn't express it in graph theoretic language. Anyway, all proofs start with. Uh, okay. Uh, you want to use uh, the fact that this is multilinear. And it turns out identities are without loss of mul generality multilinear. If you have a, a multilinear, if you have a polynomial identity of degree D, then there is a multilinear uh, identity of degree D. But anyway, this is multilinear. And we can use it. How do we use it? We just take a basis for the set of matrices. What's the set of ba what's the basis? It's just all these matrices, which we can call Eij, which is just a matrix, and by a matrix, which in position i and j, it's one, and otherwise it's zero everywhere. Okay. This, of course, is a linear basis for the. Uh, for the space, if we prove this theorem just for this type of matrices, then we prove it for all matrices, right? Just expand by multilinearity, and everything will be written. Uh, you know, you just get monomials uh, of this. And now, you know, what's the graph theoretic interpretation of this? You can see, we know that uh, Eij, Ekl, you multiply two of these matrices, it will be either zero if k is uh, different than j, right? Or it will be E i l if k equals j. Obvious. So this is like parts in graph. And in fact, what this statement says is the following. So uh, you know we are going to plug an arbitrary set of these unit elements for these matrices. So these are edges in a graph. The graph has two n vertices. One, two, three, up to two n. And there will be edges. Uh, you know, this can be like this. It can be like this. There can be another edge like this. So this is whatever uh, uh, the, the I'm just, just writing it as a set. Each one of the variables that appear here is some eij, so I'm just using them. I mean, I'm just, uh, some of them may be like self-loop. It does not have to be connected, whatever. But we have two n edges. Right? And now what does it mean that uh, this polynomial is zero? Well, you know, so every, every entry of the, this a matrix, every entry of this matrix, and by n matrix is zero. What's the entry of this matrix? You want that the ij entry will be zero. So you just look what happens when you take parts here from i to j in this graph. And you want to check, you know, it, maybe it doesn't exist, but you want to count it, and then you have to count it because of this uh, alternation. You, you basically, have to traverse this path because of self loops and the reverse edges. There may be several ways. You just have to count that the even number of times and the odd number of times is the same. And that's that's what proves it. And it's easy. That's the proof. Okay. So we have this uh, one side of the one side of the theorem. The other side. which is not so important for us because that serves us already for PIT. We know that big enough matrices, uh, sorry, no, no, no. Uh, th this was not important for us. The other direction, we want to show something is not, that if we take big enough matrices, why am I erasing this? Let me show. So just, I mean, I don't need much for this part. So we want to, sh to say that if the degree is slightly less than 2n, already we cannot have cancellation for everything. And we again know that by the same argument as before, we might as well uh, use these matrices because if it vanished on all of them, it will vanish everywhere. So might as well think of a good assignment uh, from here. And 
let me assume, but I said that this uh, without loss of generality, that P is multilinear. So if there was an identity, then you can assume it's a multilinear linear identity. So we need an assignment. We need a, a set of uh, matrix units like this that will uh, not vanish on our polynomial. But the only way we know that the polynomial doesn't vanish, we, well, that's not the only way, but it's a canonical way. We want to isolate a monomial, which is non-zero on this assignment, right? And all other monomials become zero. So without loss of generality, you can assume that the first monomial is x1, x2, up to x2n, n minus 1. Some monomial. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's some monomial. And anybody has a guess which matrix units to fit there? And there are other monomials, right? So put here E11, E12. E22, two two, H23, two Xnn. Yeah. Look at this assignment to these variables. That's the only thing you need. Okay? You then put zeros in the, you know, the zero matrix as if there are other variables. I claim that here, when we evaluate this monomial, it's just the path, right? It will get, this will be e, E1n when you evaluate it. But if you take any other monomial, any other ordering of these, you know, it will be this connector, so it will be zero. So it's one of the things we really would, lo would love to have in de-randomization, the explicit assignments which sort of isolate. <laughs> so in the non-commutative world, it turns out to be simple. Let's say it's homogeneous for this. Yeah, you can, there can be low, you can, you can generalize it, but here I assumed multilinear and uh, homogeneous, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, questions? Well, it's more comp, it, it, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. We don't know if it's, it's uh, I was going to say it's more complicated, but it's uh, also less complicated because it's non-commutative. So that's just one way of doing it and reduces it in some sense to the commutative setting. I mentioned that, uh, first of all, in the white box model, if, if uh, you, know, you are given the circuit or the formula or the uh, branching program, at least for formulas and branching programs, the Ras Pilka result gives a polynomial time identity testing. So you don't need matrices. You work with this rank uh, idea of, uh, of uh, Nissan. And uh, for circuits, we don't know. For circuits, we don't know. And the best way we have is this PCP thing. Of course, this can be evaluated, right? So, so this leads to uh, what I said about the PITs in this case. Okay. Uh, good. So now, for polynomials, you see, we know the size of matrices that will make them, that will make them non-vanishing. And what about rational identities? So this is really, you know, so rational identities are much more mysterious than polynomial identities. By, by the way, I should say that the polynomial identities is a huge field. There are many books on it and it many connections also to commutative algebra, which I'm going to mention. But let me just. We tried. I don't know. Maybe you can. Yeah, we tried. So. We tried many ways. I mean, I don't know. And I, I should say that nobody, uh, nobody I talk to in, in the world of algebra and non-commutative algebra knows. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's hopeless, but let me make it concrete. So we want to ask the rational identity testing problem. So given some rational expression. So what we asked about, what we asked about uh, polynomials over there. Um, and here's something that uh, we know. We know that it's identically zero, exactly if whatever size matrices we put in, 
it will become zero, right? So the only thing is having a, <laughs> so if it's not identical, we know that if R is not zero, then there exists some K uh, such that uh, and matrices A1, A2 from N K of F such that R on A1 is not a zero matrix. So the question is what's the minimal K? And of course, what's the minimal K should depend on something about R. Uh, you know, so what? So what is the? The smallest k. K, and uh, you can say in terms of L of R, maybe C of R. And what I want to argue is uh, a third parameter here, which is a parameter that uh, follows from the fact that we know that x inverse is complete for formulas. So it's something that will be between them. It's a, a sort of the determinant or sort of the inverse complexity, not the determinant complexity of R. So let me just uh, phrase this question uh, explicitly. So we can ask what's the smallest k, but let me just uh, phrase this question explicitly. And for this, I want to tell you just a bit more about Kohn's uh, construction. I mentioned that Kohn's construction generates this invertible, uh, you know, uh, it says that the field elements are exactly the entries of the inverses of invertible matrices, but of polynomials. But what are the invertible matrices? What are the invertible? Wh when you see a, a, you know, a matrix with the polynomial entries, is it invertible in this field? And it turns out that he proves that uh, exactly which elements are invertible. So a matrix uh, so it's a matrix of uh, um, Tij We have a matrix of non-commutative polynomials is invertible in this free skew field if and only if A is full. What is full? Full you should think of full rank. Full is full rank. Full. So what, what does it mean? Uh, but you need to define it because rank is not defined. So this is if and only if A cannot be written as B times C, also matrices of polynomials, which are, let's say, this is n by n, such that uh, this is n by r, and this is r by n, so r is less than n. So it just cannot be written as a product. This is really peculiar if you think about it. Why is it peculiar? that uh, the invertible matrices are exactly the full matrices. In the commutative case, it's not true. I can give you a matrix which is full, but it's not invertible. Anybody can think so? Commutative setting, look at this matrix. I mean, once I write it, you'll know. Here, if the variables commute, right, this is uh, the, the, you know, the determinant of this is zero. This is a, right, a skewed symmetric matrix of odd size. The determinant is zero. But you cannot write it as a product of a three by two and two by three matrices. So it's not true in the commutative uh, setting. Of course, non-commutativity plays, uh, you know, the determinant here is zero because, you know, x, y, and y, x cancel. <laughs> We swoon them. Yeah. It's over polynomials. I mean, if over polynomials, it's not efficient to expand. Yeah. It's, uh, 
but uh, anyway I'm, I'm just pointing out that this is not sort of uh, it's, it's a bit strange It may yeah. need to be a rational yeah. uh, function. Yeah. Uh, yeah, rational function. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, we have this. So, uh, I want to look at uh, full matrices and their invertibility. We just, uh, you know, so you, you can ask the question: uh, Is a full? And if you think about the construction I gave for the completeness of matrix inverse, you will see that uh, you know at some point we, we need to invert. And if you you know if you were uh, you know you really wanted to check that your expression is legal, you would make sure that it's invertible. So asking whether a matrix is full, which is invertible, is almost the same as asking whether it's another matrix is zero, because only zero cannot be invertible. So also here we have the so this is roughly so this is roughly the original RIT question. Given a matrix of polynomials, is it uh, is it full? So we have. So I now want to state this uh, this question. And One connection to um, commutative algebra. So this question, we know how to solve it. It's just by substituting matrices into the variables that appear in the. Okay. So let me even assume that a. As entries are variables or, con or constants. In fact, then we don't even need a constant. But anyway, uh, if you notice, the construction we gave for the completeness of the inverse actually has this property. So we might as well deal only with them. Also, there is a general reduction, sort of a generic reduction that takes any matrix of polynomials and makes it bigger matrix with just you know, variable. So we might as well think of this. So you can think of A as what sometimes is called the linear tensor. So A, let me assume that both the number of variables and the size of the matrix is N. OK, so A is really the sum of AI. Xi, so we have n variables. Some of AI, where the AIs are matrices over the field. Okay, so it's just that's what a matrix with, uh, you know, uh, I'm allowing, I guess, not just variables, maybe I'm allowing linear form. You can, you can do both. Okay, what do we know? We know that A is not identically zero. Sorry, A is full. If and only if for some matrices that we plug in, we get something non-zero. In fact, it will, uh, well, so let me write, if and only if there exists a K and there exists matrices B1, Bn in Mk of F, so that when we substitute this bigger matrix will be invertible and since this will become elements of the field they commute this is just about the determinant of this matrix so the determinant of this sum ai tensor bi is not zero okay so 
We have a test for fullness. We just plug large enough matrices, maybe random, and uh, uh, so, and then and then we get the right expression. The, the question is, what is the is the minimum for which this is true? And yeah, this is a question like we asked just before about uh, about rational expressions and fitting formulas into them. But in this formulation, it is a, a classical question that is, uh, you know, under attack by people from, uh, you know, algebraic geometry and invariant theory, everything that Josh was talking about yesterday. So why? So how is it related? So I'll tell you in, uh, yeah, because I have only uh, a few minutes. Uh, Uh, let me just say that uh, this kind, of this question, what's the smallest k, comes up also in division elimination, which I described yesterday. So I will have no time to describe it today. Uh, I just told you that in commutative uh, rings, if you are uh, computing by arithmetic circuits and there is division, you can eliminate it. Uh, it's not obvious how to do it if we are in the non-commutative setting because exactly of polynomial identities. And you know, what we show is that, uh, so one can generalize Strassen uh, to say that, you know, there is division elimination which is efficient in terms of whatever k this is. So if you, you know, if you know that the expressions in your formula don't vanish on some k by k uh, things, then we can eliminate division. If it's computing a polynomial, we can eliminate division. So this problem comes up also in the division elimination. And I want to tell you just for to conclude where it comes up in, uh, uh, where it comes up in uh, sort of representation theory. And uh, the way it comes up is the following. So I'll be, I'll be brief, but Here's the tuple of matrices that uh, define my matrix S, just to define the linear form. Mm. Now, you can study, and people are studying, uh, the orbits and the representation theory of such tuple of matrices under the action of GLN, or what for us will be more relevant GLN squared. So the action of GLN, so the, if we take some matrix uh, M in GLN, you know, such a thing would transform to, so this would be conjugation. Oops, sorry. MA1, M inverse. So a matrix A will con a matrix M will convert this tuple to this tuple. It's a group action, and you can study its representations, and you can study the invariant ring of polynomials uh, over such tuples. So those polynomials which remain unchanged under any such transformation, and this ring of polynomials is completely understood, and it's generated. I'm not going to write by. I mean by very simple. Uh, polynomial. So that's that's more or less understood. Although Josh told me that lots of things are not understood about it, but the basic, we have a first and second fundamental theorem. So that's okay. Is there a ring in yeah, there is in finite, finite dimension. Yeah, all these finally rings are generated. finally generated. So yeah, all these rings. This is a general the Hilbert uh, uh, result that they are finitely generated, and we know a, a nice basic for these invariant polynomials. But now we want to look at the action of two matrices. So let's say we have two matrices. Then the action again, you know, uh, will be the natural thing. You simply do it, m move it to, you multiply on the left and the right by different matrices. It's another group action. You can study its rings of, uh, of, uh, you know, invariant polynomial. And only recently were the, were the, um, 
basis, uh, the, the polynomials that generate uh, this invariant ring characterize, so polynomials which will look the same under such transformation. And the, uh, you know, pretty amazingly, this, uh, the generators are exactly for all k and for all b1 up to bn, just the same expression. Maybe it was done on only over the complex number. Basically, the <coughs> ring of invariant polynomials, the polynomials that don't change under this action, are ge generated by, by this, so by the same. And they also want to know, and they are trying to find out, what the dimension, they ask themselves the same question, you know. So it's finitely generated. We know that there is a k where it stops. We don't need to take all of them. Uh, what's the smallest k? Yeah, so it's an open problem there as well. I just, uh, and it's act under active attack. I should say that there are exponential uh, upper bounds, but nothing, nothing better. <coughs> uh, that's it.